fighter encountered alone and in groups protecting Nazi bombers. Sometimes it is used as a photographic ship or as a light bomber. The ME-110 is a two-place, twin-engine, low-wing monoplane, approximately the same size as our P-38. Post-World War I, air combat was still going through its formative years. Many aircraft designers still held the belief that a large, well-armed four-engine bomber could be the key to success and essentially unstoppable, resulting in many nations beginning to develop twin-engine fighters with overwhelming firepower to overcome this threat. It was from this doctrine that the Bf-110 was born. Developed by Messerschmitt, the 110 was initially classed as a destroyer fighter to complete this exact role. However, it would evolve into many variations of itself and undergo a complete transformation before the end of the war. The story of the 110 began in the 1930s when the German Ministry of Aviation issued a request for a new two-engine fighter with long-range cannons and a bomb bay. The Messerschmitt design defeated those of Focke-Wulf, Arado and Henschel and by the end of 1935 had evolved into its familiar recognisable form with twin vertical stabilizers and an all-metal construction. It actually disregarded the internal bomb load requirement in favour of increased armament. The DB600 engines powering the aircraft actually made it faster than requested, despite having various reliability issues. These reliability issues actually got bad enough that the first 45 BF110Bs were actually forced to use underpowered Jumo 210G engines before the far superior DB601 became available and ready to use. Hermann Goering, chief of the Luftwaffe, found the idea of the 110 extremely appealing seeing flights of them painted brightly in an almost romantic way. This led to him becoming a major advocate for the aircraft, and even taking some of the most promising single-engine pilots for use in his beloved fleet, much to the dismay of others in the Luftwaffe. Initially, the 110 was armed with four 7.92mm MG-17 machine guns and two 20mm MG FF cannons, an extremely potent armament, especially pre-war. It also featured a rear gunner with a further 7.92mm machine gun to defend the vulnerable rear of the aircraft. This vulnerability was not created by its speed or armament, but rather its lack of manoeuvrability. This would result in far from successful operations during the Battle of Britain in 1940. Fighting against Polish biplanes was one thing, but when faced with the combatant Spitfires and Hurricanes of the RAF, the 110 fell short. The 110s couldn't defend the bomber formations for fear of being shot down themselves and paid the price, with 223 of the 237 110s initially employed over the channel being lost. Was this due to the aircraft or the way it was employed? More on that later. Its involvement in the Battle of Britain was so poorly executed that it was later relegated to a ground strike role in theatres such as North Africa and the Eastern Front after the beginning of Operation Barbarossa. However, it would be a change in RAF Bomber Command strategy which would finally see it fulfil its potential. The RAF's switch to night bombing in 1940 meant that Germany suddenly required a competent night fighter capable of facing the hordes of British bombers on their way to destroy German cities and their war effort. Among other candidates, such as the Dornier DO-17Z and the Junkers JU-88C2, the Bf-110 was the first choice. As a night fighter, it would be able to play to all its strengths, such as high speed, heavy armament, and simple flying characteristics, whilst not having to worry about a lack of manoeuvrability, with the only enemy planes in the air being lumbering Stirlings, Hamptons, Lancasters, and the like. There was one issue, however. How to see the enemy bombers in the dead of night? The initial night fighters had no guidance system, and the likelihood of spotting a bomber was entirely dependent on the eyesight of the pilots. This had a limited effect, and even the introduction of an infrared sensor later would prove fairly ineffective. What would change all of this, however, would be the introduction of a proper radar system. The Bf 110 F4 variant, the Luftwaffe's first truly successful night fighter, was equipped with a 202 Liechtenstein radar with a decent operating range of 3 to 4 kilometers. The 110 only improved from there on. Another innovation to have devastating effect would be the introduction of the Schrager Musik cannons. These were two 20mm cannons mounted in the rear section of the cockpit which would fire upwards at an almost 90 degree angle, meaning that the fire from rear gunners could be completely avoided by the German crews, since British bombers lacked the ball turret on the underside of the aircraft that American aircraft such as the B-17 possessed. 
This proved so devastatingly effective that the only threat the German pilots and navigators faced was the threat of accidentally firing upwards into the loaded bomb bay of a British bomber and destroying themselves in the process. Rather, fuel tanks or engines were targeted to ensure destruction of the bomber. One of the first kills made using the new Liechtenstein radar system was made on 18th November 1942 by Oberleutnant Reinhold Nacke. After receiving a radar reading, Nacke pushed the 110 to full throttle and slowly closed on the bomber formation. He was to be surprised, however, when his radar operator surprisingly yelled that another contact had appeared just two kilometers away. Switching attention to this target, the 110 drew closer and closer until the target, a four-engine Sterling bomber, was just 200 meters ahead and 50 meters above them. Naka would fire burst after burst into the wings before bright flame gushed from the engines and fuel tanks, dooming the bomber to explode with a bright flash over Rotterdam Harbor. A more unconventional encounter would occur in late April 1944 as Wilhelm Jönen attacked a Lancaster, taking a chance by encroaching over Swiss airspace. He only managed to fire once on the British bomber, but return fire resulted in his port engine being struck. The next instant, he found himself in the grip of a Swiss searchlight battery and was forced to land in Zurich. His aircraft blew up in mysterious circumstances just a few days later, quite obviously at the hands of the Gestapo. The 110 was certainly powerful by night, but not immune. Further reinforcing the dominance of the 110 in the night skies above Europe, however, was Heinz Wolfgang Schnaufer, a leading Luftwaffe night fighter race, as he recorded a shattering seven Lancaster bomber kills within 20 minutes using the radar system on the 21st of February 1945. Many RAF bombing raids would suffer unsupportable losses due to the deadly combination of ground radar units and the by then highly potent 110. The aforementioned ground radar system was another key link in the system. After enemies were picked up by a long-range Freyer radar, a Würzburg ground radar would track the bomber formation and transmit it to the control center, where the 110, also controlled by its own dedicated ground-based radar, would be directed onto its target. It was a highly sophisticated system and typical of the German armored forces during World War II, infrastructure years ahead of its time. However, despite the aura of technical brilliance surrounding the German armed forces during World War II, created primarily by images of fantastical prototypes such as the Mouse and E-series of tanks, the legendary Tigers and Panthers, and the jet-powered ME262, the BF-110 initially seems to stand out as a failure in implementation. The thing is, in the late 1930s, when the RAF was still flying their Gloucester Gladiators and other biplanes, the BF-110 must have seemed as futuristic as an F-35 does compared to an F-86 from the Korean War. So how did it turn out that it could possibly fail so spectacularly in its initially intended role? The issue came about as the Luftwaffe failed to adjust to the rapid technological advancement of other nations, almost out of character for them at the time. As mentioned, a fast heavy fighter with overwhelming firepower would have performed very well against Gloucester gladiators and the like, but as allied nations developed more advanced fighters, the Luftwaffe stuck to their guns and still employed the 110 as if it was facing inferior opposition. The 110 was employed as a close escort to the hordes of German bombers raiding England in 1940, expected to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the British fighters in close combat, protecting the bombers and supporting the already outdated ideology that the bomber will always get through, given sufficient numbers. If the BF-110 had been employed in a role it was more suited to, sweeping in at a high altitude ahead of a bomber formation, clearing the air of enemy fighters before the bombers arrived with superior firepower and altitude, playing to all their strengths, then they would have been a formidable opponent by day. In fact, when employed in this manner, the BF-110 appears to have had a better ratio of enemies shot down to planes lost than any other fighter type during the Battle of Britain. Yet due to the outdated ideology of the Luftwaffe in terms of this particular aircraft, these successes have been largely forgotten. When the 110 suffered high losses, it was when they were ordered to fly slow, close escort missions to the bombers, and unfortunately for Goering's favorite aircraft, this was most of the time. This begs a question, who in the Nazi leadership was causing this? One might think it was Hermann Goering himself, but he was an advocate more than anyone else for free-ranging, independent fighter wings to be unleashed on free hunting. Rather, it was often Luftwaffe commanders in France, eager to protect their bomber formations, who would mistakenly take this approach. Even the famously successful Messerschmitt Bf 109 would suffer extreme losses when encouraged to fly in this manner. The complications of the British radar and the logistics of flying long missions over enemy territory only reinforced these issues. As more and more aircraft were developed over the course of the war, 
the entire concept of the World War II heavy fighter became flawed. With the introduction of fighters such as the American P-51 Mustang, with its incredibly high speed and range, the entire idea of a heavy fighter began to fall out of favour. Single engine fighters can now possess speed, maneuverability and range. Even if they lacked firepower, they would more likely than not be the one on the BF-110's tail due to the combination of other factors, so why would it matter? The BF-110 concept resonates in illuminating how quickly a seemingly genius technological fix can become obsolete. The concept of the heavy fighter today is almost a distant memory, and this was already the case by the late stages of the war. As a night fighter, it excelled in facing lumbering slow bombers under the cover of night, but by the end of the war it was an archaic mid-1930s design, one of the oldest multi-engine aircraft still in combat. Successes such as the ME-210 and 410 once again excelled in their roles as night fighters, but as a destroyer, the famed destroyer fighter, the BF-110 had been doomed by poor utilisation, rapid technological advancement, and outdated air warfare ideology.